you know, Go is unusual in that we have this talented, well-paid, employed team at Google who's driving this major open source project. We do try very hard to engage productively with the community, and we've tried to increase our transparency over time. You know, I think Russ Cox has done a lot of work to make the proposal review process more transparent and things like that. In the end, we also try and build a highly functioning cross-functional team that leverages the diverse talents we have, like Cameron's and Alice's and several others. And we believe this is an asset to the community. We serve the community better by building this highly functioning, well-managed team. So the question of governance comes down to what are the problems we're trying to solve? And this is where we want to hear the community. Like, what's not happening that you would want to see happen? Because governance is a solution to a problem. And again, we'd want to really understand the problem well to understand how best to serve the community in that way. Big thanks to our partners, Linode Fastly and LaunchDarkly. We love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Get $100 in credit at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. And get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. This episode is brought to you by Sourcegraph. Sourcegraph is universal code search that lets you move fast, even in big code bases. Here's CTO and co-founder Byung Liu explaining the problems that Sourcegraph solves for software teams. Yeah, so at a high level, the problems that Sourcegraph solves, it's this problem of, for any given developer, there's kind of two types of code in the world, roughly speaking. There's the code that you wrote and understand, like the back of your hand, and then there's the code that some idiot out there wrote. Or, you know, alternatively, if you know you don't like the term idiot, it's the code that some inscrutable genius wrote and that you're trying to understand. And oftentimes that inscrutable genius is like you from, you know, a year ago. <laughs> and, and you're going back and, and trying to make heads or tails of, of what's going on. And really, Sourcegraph is about making that code that some idiot or inscrutable genius wrote feel more like the code that you wrote and understand kind of intuitively. It's all about helping you grok all the code that's out there, all the code that's in your organization, all the code that is relevant to you in open source, all the code that you need to understand in order to do your job, which is to build the feature, write the new code, fix the bug, etc. All right, learn how Sourcegraph can help your team at info.sourcegraph.com slash changelog. Again, info.sourcegraph.com slash changelog. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from around the Go community. This episode kicks off our GopherCon coverage. We had a blast making these episodes for you, and we hope to see everyone IRL at next year's conf. Subscribe now if you haven't at GoTime.fm and follow the show on Twitter. We are at GoTimeFM. Okay, here we go. Hello and welcome to a very special Go Time Go For Con mashup. I'm Matt Raya and today I'm going to be putting your questions to members of the Go team. So please hang out in the Discord channel. It's uh, Go Team AMA. Ask your questions in there. Let's see who's on the panel today then. Well, we're joined by Samir Ajmani. Hello, Samir, engineering director, and you run the Go team, right? That's right. I manage to go team at Google. I you know, basically have to keep everyone happy and get them all paid. <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate it. We're also joined by uh, Cameron Balahan, who's looking at the product side of Go. Right, Cameron? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm a product manager. I'm one of two product leads for Go, along with Steve Francia. My focus in Go is primarily on the ID tools and security spaces, but I also work across all of Go, especially as it relates to how we position it in Google. Yeah, very interesting to think of a programming language having a product. I'm keen to dig into that a bit more. We're also joined by Alice Merrick, who's a UX researcher, and you run the, the Go developer survey, right, Alice? That's right. If you took the Go developer survey in the last couple of weeks, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a part of a small group of UX people that we work on various things. But yeah, the Go developer survey is definitely 
the largest or most visible one. Yeah. What happens if no, you get nobody answering? Can you just have a day off? That's never been a problem. Good. <laughs> we got over 10,000 responses this year. It was amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, wow, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're also joined by Rob Findlay. Rob, you do sort of the tools side of things, particularly generics, right, recently? Correct. Yeah. I'm on the Go Tools team at Google. I work on, work on Go, please. But also, recently, I've also been working on support for generics in the Go type checker and parser. Yeah. So very, very cool. And everyone's very excited about generics. And I'm keen to also kind of understand what the impact of these kind of big language decisions are on the tools because obviously it's a sort of domino effect down the chain no doubt and last but not least we're joined by Keith Randall hello Keith you you sort of what is your focus on the Go team I work mostly on the runtime and compiler do performance mainly although I've been working on some of the generics implementation recently Mm, very cool okay so I feel like we're going to learn a lot about generics today which is exciting yeah, so maybe we could kick off then, Samir. We're asking questions that have come from the community. So anybody watching live, if you want to head over to the Discord and ask your questions, we will try and get them answered for you. We've had some questions in already. Samir, the Go team, like when it started, it was just kind of a few people and it's grown so much over that time. What sort of challenges have you seen in that time as it's grown? What's changed? That's a great question. Yeah, when I joined the Go team, I think it was 12 people. And now, including our cross-functional partners, we're upwards of 50. Wow. And it's really quite remarkable growth over a period of time. But it's been a bit spiky. So a lot of our recent growth was in 2018, 2019. And so a lot of our time since then has really been about scaling our team and the way we work to really gel and, you know, new processes and all the sort of managerial work to make sure that the team works well. But it has allowed us to take Go from just being a language to more of an end-to-end platform. We have full-fledged IDE support. We have the Go command, which has been a platform, all sorts of extensions. Of course, there's our suite of libraries and then our web suite around go.dev and package discovery site. So this larger team has enabled us to really build something much more holistic. So Go feels like Go throughout the various things developers have to do. In order to succeed, we've invested a lot in having more cross-functional partners. So on the call, we have Cameron and Alice, who are two examples, and we have many more. Challenge-wise, Scaling, scaling the team, scaling the user base, scaling with larger uses of code. And a lot of this is driven by mainstream usage. So instead of our early adopters, we're now dealing with mainstream adopters, enterprise adopters who are maybe looking for a slightly different thing from Go. And security is top of mind, both for enterprises and all the supply chain security attacks. And Cameron, I'm sure, can help speak to more to those issues. Yes, that's very interesting then. One of the things about Go that I think I appreciated when I first looked at the language was some of the principles like the simplicity and and some of the trade-offs and the taste that was kind of in the design. How do you make sure that people that join the Go team kind of really understand those principles? Is it something that you find you have to teach a lot or do you find people that naturally think that way or does it not matter? Do you prefer the mix? It used to be that we hired a lot from the community, in which case we were hiring like-minded people. As we've grown and diversified, there's a bit more of an onboarding journey to sort of get the ethos across. I think a lot of it's peer-to-peer. We, you know, New engineers will work with existing engineers on the team. Within Google, we have processes for helping people learn how to use Go and write idiomatic Go. And there's, of course, documents on this as well. For example, our tech writer is a good example. You know, He came in with great experience writing for enterprise users and had to learn really what the Go voice was how we communicate, but he also educated us on how to better connect with the users. So it's bi-directional. That's very interesting. Yeah. So it's funny to think of Go really starting out as a language and as you say, growing and like that, it's, it kind of makes sense that you have a product perspective on it. So Cameron, how does that work? What sort of things do you care about as the product person for Go, the language and the tool chains and the community and the ecosystem? Yeah. So, you know, it's not that different from something that's not an open source language uh, ecosystem. Everything's different in its own way. We're not looking to, you know, monetize this or something like that sort. So there are some differences, but really it's got the same sort of things any product would have. You've got to think about its strategic direction, like the complete end-to-end picture of what we're trying to accomplish and whether all the different pieces are lined up to sort of get us there. 
And then you also want to think about like, what is the, what you're the voice of the user. What is the sort of research we have and what have our users been telling us and how can we synthesize all of that to try to add more value and, and make Go a better product, a language that more folks want to use to accomplish their goals. And you know, that's just our goal and just to try to keep that whole uh, vision together and moving forward as a coherent whole rather than a bunch of individual pieces. Yeah. Have you seen any examples so far of tension between a sort of technical perspective and a product perspective? Is, that, is it joined up quite nicely because of the nature of the project or are there ever those sorts of disagreements between you? You know, I'd say not that many disagreements, really. It's like the, the whole Go team is interested in trying to make Go a better experience and something that contributes value. So we're all hungry to figure that out. And so, you know, we all sort of collaboratively work together to try to do that. It's like nobody's really trying to just go engineer something that uh, is off the value path. Everyone is looking to see what's next, what are our customers really looking to do, and how can we better service that? So. I'd say the answer is no. It's all been a very a good, coherent thing together. That's really interesting. And of course, a big part of product is hearing from users, as you say. And so that's another th unusual thing, I think, that you wouldn't expect to have on an open source project of if it was just a programming language is a user research, user experience research. What sorts of things do you research, Alice? Yeah, well, I'll talk a little bit about what I have researched and, and also what some of my... Uh, fellow researchers have worked on. So kind of the lower level stuff is too low level for us. We're kind of looking a, a little higher at, you know, things like developer workflows. Mm. So how somebody might look for documentation or packages when they are writing Go, for example. Things like when you are in your IDE, what kind of challenges do you have there? when you're debugging, looking for those kinds of challenges and, and opportunities of where could we improve something, where could maybe uh, introduce something new into the ecosystem as far as tooling goes or smooth out some workflow there. So those are kind of some of the interesting questions that we've looked at. Another thing is that we, we do run the annual survey. So looking at, you know, how happy are, you know, are people using Go? And like, you know, do we see more usage in particular areas? And like, where are opportunities that we might want to grow? Uh, Cameron sort of mentioned leveraging some of that research on the product side. And then uh, recently, you know, we were looking at like, you know, what are people really concerned about as Go developers? And what, you know, what other areas might we branch into? This year, I did a study that was looked at specifically people who considered using Go and then didn't and why. Mm. And is there something that we could do there that would make it easier for more people to use Go? If error doesn't equal nil, isn't it? That's the big complaint. Yeah. Actually, no. But mm. uh, <laughs> what is it then? That's only a problem for people who are using Go, apparently. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't drive people away. I met somebody once and he just said, I saw how many times I had to write that and I just thought, no, no. <laughs> it's like proper dramatic. Yeah. So he wasn't happy. But. That's true. They, you know, and at that point, they might not, I might not have even spoken to them because they didn't consider Go seriously enough to even make it through the filter of people for us to talk to. <laughs> Fair enough. Brutal. That's true. Yeah. That could have turned somebody off very early in the pipeline and we just didn't find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's very interesting. Well, you see, I mean, I actually like it. I love the fact that we sort of are faced with errors all the time and we have to deal with it in some way. I think that is, it turns out to be a positive for us. But yes, I've heard that in the past. So obviously generics is a big feature that's coming. And this was one that was talked about in the community for many years before. This one is a reason why I've heard people avoid Go because for a particular class of problem, generics kind of are perfect. So, Rob, you've been tasked with the responsibility of making generics work in the tools. What kind of impact does it have and what sort of work have you had to do there? Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting to see the way such a large language change propagates throughout the tools ecosystem. I and mean, there's, there's been a lot of work on support for generics in tools, which is how I'm interpreting your question. Hmm. And I think there's a lot of work yet to do. I'll say that the it was nice to see how much just worked once we updated like the parser and type checker. Mm. A lot of things in the basic editing of code in GoPlease, for example, just worked. But where we've seen the most 
update required is for things like static analyzers, things like the vet command that need to understand Go code. Well, now there's a whole new way to understand Go code. You don't worry about the type of a variable anymore. You worry about which types of variable could be. There's many types that are possible. And so how do we manifest that in tools is an interesting question and one that we're still exploring. Mm. With people with experience, like if they've used the AST stuff, if they used those packages, has that been completely rewritten or is that just changed in a lot because of generics? No. So we've had to preserve, I mean, we have the compatibility promise and we've right. kept that promise. So uh, we have updated those packages to support generic code. So we introduced some new constructs into those packages, but we've done it in what we hope is the least obtrusive way possible. And a lot of those packages deal with generic constructs, like what's an object in a program. And that we've translated into the generic realm. So that's why a lot of stuff just worked because those packages were updated in such a way that things just make sense, I hope. This episode is brought to you by our friends at LaunchDarkly. Feature management for the modern enterprise. Power testing in production at any scale. Here's how it works. LaunchDarkly enables development teams and operation teams to deploy code at any time, even if a feature isn't ready to be released to users. Wrapping code with feature flags gives you the safety to test new features and infrastructure in your production environments without impacting the wrong end users. When you're ready to release more widely, update the flag status and the changes are made instantaneously by the real-time streaming architecture. Eliminate risk, deliver value, get started for free today at launchdarkly.com. Again, launchdarkly.com. Well, yeah, we have a question from Aaron on Discord, and this is related to this. And Keith, this might be a good one for you since you've worked on generics at the compiler level. The question was, how are you measuring success of generics? How do we know if it was a good thing to have done or not in, say, five years? Right, well, I think the, the major signal there is adoption. Like, how much do people actually use it? How much do they get value out of it? And that's a very nebulous evaluator, right? So it's sort of hard to say, like, if we get X adoption, we've had success, otherwise we fail. Mm. That's hard. But we can look at more specific things, like, are there libraries that people write that use generics that other people then use? And so we can look for all kinds of signals about how much is adoption is happening, how much new sort of interesting code is being written, how many people go from a V1 to a V2 where V1 didn't have generics and V2 does. Mm. So there's sort of things like that that we can look at. I'm sort of look at generics at a much lower level, which is make sure it doesn't crash, make sure that it's as fast as writing the code out with a code generator, mm. sort of all that side of stuff. And that I can get more concrete evaluations of that, that sort of thing. And so that's sort of where I'm at. I think at a higher level, at like Samir's level, they're thinking more about how do we measure adoption? That's a more nebulous thing. I'm very concerned about is generics 2% slower and is that enough or is it too much and why and can we fix it that's the sort of stuff i concentrate on i can pick this up if you're if you want to hear the higher level success criteria like for the last several years you know we've been running the developer survey now i think at least since 2016 yeah it's, this is the sixth year wow right a few things have been sitting at the top of the what i want from go list and generics has been number one dependency management i think was up there if you look at our issue tracker fuzzing is up there and you know better support my editor We've really you taken all of that to heart and really, you know, we took our time with generics because we needed it to feel like Go. And I think Robert and Ian's talk this morning really showed the effort that was taken to really make it fit with the language really beautifully. Our hope is that it's not necessarily that we need people to adopt generics a lot. So it's not like more generics is better, but generics should solve the problem it's designed to solve. And so we want to really see that whatever problem people were saying, oh, we need generics to solve, that concern goes away. And if we've resolved that concern, if we've resolved dependency management, vulnerability scanning is another one, right? We resolve that. What then starts bubbling up in the concern list, right? So this allows us to look at the next set of concerns and resolve that. And 
hopefully we just keep making go for it better for the users over time. Mm. And if people want to influence that process, then I guess the developer survey is the way that you're asking them to do that. That's a good way to do it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely tell me all about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's an interesting question from Segfault AX. Do you expect there'll be any changes to error handling idioms post generics? So this is kind of a general question in lots of ways. So Matt, we did try. Mm-hmm. You certainly <laughs> did. We'll put the drums in in post. Don't worry. That definitely deserved one. Yeah. So we, we did explore simplifying error handling with the try proposal a few years ago. And our assessment or the assessment of the community, really not ours, was that it didn't make things better. That the explicitness, the debugability of the current way of handling errors was simply better. That all the work we tried to do with sort of condensing the syntax and then moving the handlers up to defer, it just made things worse. And so I think this is a case where we really want to understand what is the problem, right, that users are struggling with. And I think people like Alice and Todd, our other UX researcher, can really help us dig into that. That'll help us understand what solution we should be going for. But I think we need to understand the problem better first. Mm. I think it is an interesting question of whether generics is a new tool in the toolbox that can make a new interesting design that may be better in some way or another. I don't think anyone's come up with a good answer to that question yet, but it's certainly something to explore. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, if you've got code that's working in a generic way, I expect the errors to kind of work in a generic way, potentially, like if it's going to return some object that contains a value that, you know, there's some error to the value or whatever, then I could see that kind of thing happening quite easily. Is anyone worried about us overusing generics? This is one of the big arguments that people make against having generics in the language is that it can be abused. How do we feel about that? Are we worried? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the remedy? Education, I think, setting a good example. But honestly, we need the community to help with this. This isn't something that can come top down, right? I think Go has a reputation for being a simple, comprehensible, readable language. It is very easy to use generics to create things that make code inscrutable. And so I think we as a community, when we do code review, when we adopt libraries, need to be conscious of the trade-off we make between perhaps a deep functional one-liner that is very concise, but very inscrutable, hard to debug, hard to manage the performance of it versus the more explicit way we write things in Go that, yeah, costs you a little bit more typing, but when you have to debug it and optimize it, it's way simpler. So that's where my head is at, but I would love to hear from others on the panel. Any of the takers? Yeah, one thing that is coming out in 118 is generics for the core, but like much of the standard library doesn't have any generics in it. Mm. In fact, there are only a couple of packages that were added that had generics in it. Most of the rest of the standard library is still pre-generics. And so we want to find a way, it, probably in 119, to make some of those packages generic. And when we do that, we'd like to set a good example by making them generic in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And so I think to some extent, we'll be piloting a good experience with converting existing code to generics and maybe ad in addition, you know, adding like the maps package or whatever, some other new package and what does a good generic code look like. Mm. And I think that will help. And if you're interested in what good generic code looks like and don't want to wait for 119, you can sort of follow along in the CLs or on the issues to look at what the prototypes look like. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So do you expect there to be generic versions of some of the libraries and you can kind of have both because of the backwards compatibility? Or will there be types alongside non-generic types inside the packages? How do you see that happening? Well, we're certainly not going to break any existing code. So we sort of have to leave the things as is. There's some discussion about how we might add generics in a backwards compatible way to function so that sort of the type inference all magically works out. Mm. I don't think we know whether that's possible yet, but we're talking about it. And if not, then there'll be a set of parallel different packages or different names within the same package that will be the generic versions of mm. various things like container list and whatever else. Yeah, interesting. And you could automate migration from you know the say interface based version to a generic version as well. But that should be fairly straightforward. Oh, I see. Yeah, help people out with tools. Mm -hmm. And speaking of tools, I wonder what was like Cameron the the biggest challenge like what was the hardest thing to do when trying to get generics to work with the tools was there one thing in particular that stood out as difficult 
I would say that Robert's probably the better one to speak to this, but I can say that the overall theme has been that because this is the biggest change that we've ever made to the language, by its nature, it's very deliberate. I couldn't identify a specific thing as well as Robert could, though. So maybe I'll, I'll yield to him to potentially give you a better answer than that. Okay, Robert, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you the package. Oh, yeah? <laughs> the more that a tool needs to understand about your Go program, the more difficult it's going to be to update. And so um, in our code base, the most sophisticated package that we have like this is the SSA package. And so there's still more work to be done there. And I know other external third-party tools like static check also use a form of SSA. So those things are hardest to update. Mm. So with like the reflect package, is it that there'll be extra methods and things in there, but all the other stuff will still work, but you need like, there'll be a way to find out if it's a generic type and things like that get added. So it, it turns out that a lot of the reflect or a lot of the generic stuff is completely gone by the time you get to runtime. Mm. So there's very little in reflect that needs to understand anything about generics. Does it just see the types that they end up being then? Right. So if you have a generic function that has a generic type in it and you make a reflect value out of that thing, mm. if you ask what type it is, it'll be the real concrete type of it. It won't be the generic type of it. Ah, okay. So almost everything in generics is in the compiler. There's some stuff at runtime, but it's pretty minor, like putting better stack traces than you would get otherwise and various inlining heuristics and stuff. But all that stuff occurs at compile time. There's very little at runtime that you need to worry about. And particularly Reflect is all going to work the same way as it did. The names will be a little weirder because they'll have brackets in them, but otherwise you won't notice a difference. Mm, that's very interesting then. Keep, keep. Yeah, so, sorry, yeah, Rob. I was going to say, Keith just reminded me of one other thing that was difficult, which is producing good error messages. Ah, right. Yeah. Well, we do appreciate good error messages, to be fair. So it is worth it. And actually, that's an interesting kind of point. When we think of like generics was at the top of the, the developer survey most wanted list for a while. But how do you decide what to work on? How does that happen? Does it happen somewhat organically? Or do you have some process where you think about it? And I'd also like to hear your thoughts more generally. And we had a question specifically on Twitter from Tim Heckman, who asked about governance and how you think it should be, like how these things should work and will work in the future. I guess I'll take this one. You know, we do want to be informed by our users. So we start with our users in the developer survey as one example, but Alice and her partner Todd on the UX team have done a number of studies to really help us zero in on pain points. And then our product team, Cameron and Steve, look at the broader ecosystem, look at specific users, use cases. They look at they look at things in aggregate and also look at the strategic landscape, like how is software engineering changing? So as I mentioned earlier, one thing top of mind is security. When we interviewed certain large-scale enterprise customers, one of their first questions was, how do we check Go programs for vulnerabilities? And there's a compliance reason for that. But it turns out when we interviewed the users, like it's top of mind for all the developers because it's scary, right? And so we knew we wanted to make that streamlined and easy. And it turns out that the work we did on modules actually really helps us with this, right? So we're able to build a vulnerability checking system that leverages modules and packages. And then we have a, a team that works on deep static analysis. We're able to leverage their work to really build something much more precise than you might get just checking the module level for finding vulnerabilities. So it's a bit of looking at what developers are concerned about and how to meet those needs, and also looking at what assets we have. Like the fact that we have modules, the fact that we have static analysis means we can do something really interesting that still helps solve the user problem, but in a differentiated and better way. We save you time by eliminating a lot of false vulnerability reports, for example. That's just one example. I think the other major driver is that we have a lot of users, and users are going to have production issues, scaling issues, performance issues, and we will get reports from all over the place. And then we've got our IDE and web. So we do listen to our users and we prioritize uh, the issues we're hearing from them. And some of those turn into larger projects to make you know, strategic changes to what we have. I'll add a little bit. Um, it is a bit organic, actually. You know, uh, We all sort of think about this together. We take all the data that we have, uh, we synthesize it, we try to see what's prevalent in the landscape overall and, and how we're fitting in that scheme. We're also thinking, and this is similar to something Samir said, um, but maybe a little bit different, is we think about the whole end-to-end -end experience. We think about like what it's like to be a Go developer, what you were trying to achieve as a Go developer, 
And, you know, of those options, how can we be sure that each part of that chain is accounted for and is a good experience? And if it's not a good experience, how can we make it a good experience? And then we think about how we're going to integrate with like, you know, security, for example, which is a, a really important topic right now. And we know that, you know, Go is very well positioned for that because it's always, you know, has a strong focus on security from the start. And now that it's becoming a more important, scarier issue, we think we're well positioned to, to work our strengths, think about that end to end and say, all right, at this stage, what kind of security would I want to be thinking about as a developer? Do I want to, what, what vulnerabilities do I want to know about right now? And what do I not want to know about at some certain stage? What might overwhelm me and then detract from the overall experience? So the sum of my, my message there is we try to think about it holistically and we start with the user in mind and, and the user's goal as the sort of end of this journey. And we try to pack in all of our data and everything that we learn and, and then talk about it internally. And you know, we're all very passionate about making Go a better product. So together we're able to accomplish this. And we're always interested in hearing from the users as to how we're doing and how we can do better and what we may be missing. Yeah, very interesting. And actually, there was a release today on this very day, Go 117.5 and 1.16.12 were released. And that was a, they're somewhat probably easier decisions to make because these are security related. What's the sort of process for that? How do they happen? And at what point is there a decision that this is important enough that we're going to do an, an update and a release? We have an extremely talented security and releases teams who make these decisions and they basically say, we need to do this. And we say, we're not even in their way. Basically, I got told yesterday that it was happening. I got told this morning that it was done. And, you know, there's a deep trust in the expertise these team have. Yeah, no one's going to say to the security team, nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> you can never say that, can you? You only live once. Yeah. <laughs> what Cameron described and what we were just describing bridges a bit over into governance. You know, Go is unusual in that we have this talented, well-paid, employed team at Google who's driving this major open source project. We do try very hard to engage productively with the community, and we've tried to increase our transparency over time. You know, I think Russ Cox has done a lot of work to make the proposal review process more transparent and things like that. In the end, we also try and build a highly functioning cross-functional team that, you know, leverages the diverse talents we have, like Cameron's and Alice's and several others. And we believe this is an asset to the community. We serve the community better by building this highly functioning, well-managed team, if I can take some credit for that. So the question of governance comes down to what are the problems we're trying to solve, right? And this is where we want to hear the community. Like, what's not happening that you would want to see happen? Because governance is a solution to a problem. And again, we'd want to really understand the problem well to understand how best to serve the community in that way. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Honeycomb. Honeycomb is built on the belief that there's a more efficient way to understand exactly what is happening in production right now. When production is running slow, it's hard to know exactly where problems originate. Is it your application code, your users, or the underlying systems? Teams who don't use Honeycomb scroll through endless dashboards guessing at what they mean. They deal with alert floods, guessing which ones matter, and go from tool to tool to tool, guessing at how the puzzle pieces all fit together. It's this context switching and tool sprawl that is slowly killing your teams and your business. With Honeycomb, you get a fast, unified, and clear understanding of the one thing driving your business, production. Honeycomb quickly shows you the correct source of issues, discover hidden problems, even in the most complex stacks, understand why your app feels slow to only some users. With Honeycomb, you guess less and no more. Join the swarm and try Honeycomb free today at honeycomb.io slash changelog. Again, honeycomb.io slash changelog. And by our friends at Linode, cut your cloud bills in half with Linode's Linux virtual machines. Develop, deploy, and scale your modern apps faster and easier. Whether you're developing a personal project or managing larger workloads, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions. You can get started today for free with a hundred thousand credit at linode.com slash go time. Linode has data centers all around the world with the same simple and consistent pricing regardless of location. Choose the data center that makes the most sense to you, close to you, whatever. You have access to 20 
365 human support with no tiers or handoffs. Regardless of your plan size, you can choose shared or dedicated compute instances, or you can use that credit on S3 compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes, and so much more. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Head to linode.com slash go time. Again, click on the free account button, get that credit, get started today. Once again, linode.com slash go time. Okay, so we've got a fun question coming at you now. We're going to do a quick round table. I'm just going to say your name and then just tell me what IDE you use day to day generally. Samir, what is your IDE? Google Docs at Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the rare times that I code, it's VS Code because I, I want to use what the team is developing. The VS Code ID plugin, go please. But it's rare that I get to code. It's sad. Yeah. I should just say this question came in from Billy Drop Tables. And Billy wants to know what everyone's ID is. So Cameron, do you use an IDE? Well, I certainly don't do any of that for work. But in my own time, I am a Vim user, but also a VS Code user because I like to use our products and know know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But previously, Vim. Oh, Vim. Previously, Emacs over here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. It didn't take long, did it? <laughs> You've just done some loads of street cred, though, Cameron, by the way. <laughs> Alice, how about you? What's your IDE of choice? I've actually got VS Code on in, in the background here. I, I don't have to code very often. Mostly it's just R scripts because yeah. I'm just doing some data analysis. But uh, VS Code is, it's handy. Yeah, and you've got it open now. You're just working on something while you're doing this. Yeah, I was just working on generating some graphs. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. None taken, Alice. <laughs> to be honest, this fraction of your attention we're getting is great. So don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't feel bad. I mean, it's definitely on a different screen, you know, it's like... Oh, that, what, what can you ask for? Not even looking at it. Yeah, it doesn't count if it's not on the same screen. It's not rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rob, how about you? You work on tools a lot, so you have to use the same ones that the users are using too? I primarily use Vim. But I also you know, work on VS Code, so I use VS Code as well, so I can understand the way that GoPlease looks in VS Code and in Vim, and sometimes I even use Emacs. Well, there you go. And then what about you, Keith? What's your IDE? I'm an Emacs diehard. Yep. So I use Emacs with a bunch of plugins. I've, I've tried the VS Code, oh, sorry, the GoPlease plugin, which works pretty well. And I've got that set up on my Linux machines. I still don't have it set up on my Mac, which I need to do, and that's sort of my primary sit down a code platform. So I still don't use it day to day, but I have used it in the past. But yeah, Emacs is my editor. Yeah, these text-based editors, when, when because I am I use the mouse or a trackpad, <laughs> I've never been into that. And I used to have Windows. And so there was so much point and click and stuff in MS Access and uh, Visual Basic. But yeah, when I see that, it, it's, it looks like magic still. It looks like the Matrix, like people are tapping stuff and things are happening. It's amazing. I love it. So, okay, we have another question here from Makaki. They say, hi, Go team. If there was anything you wanted to remove from Go, what would it be? And so this is assuming that there's like a go-to or you can do breaking changes now. What would you break? And Keith, since we're chatting, why don't you start? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm not a big fan of the three argument slice operation. I think there should be a slice to length and slice to capacity operations as separate things. Ah. And I lost that argument many years ago when we first edited it, and I'm still angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you would have had two, so you could either specify the capacity or the length. Is that right? Right. Yeah, I need to think about that. You often don't want to modify the capacity. You're generally just slicing because of the length, and it's only occasionally when you need to talk about the capacity, Yeah. in which case you don't need to talk about the length or you could do that as a separate slice. It makes the language a little bit simpler, mm. but yeah, otherwise, yeah, it's not a huge deal. It doesn't come up one way or the other either all that much. Yeah. No, but that's a nice answer. Rob, do you have an answer for this? What would you like to get rid of? Uh, it's really tough. Uh, nothing significant. It's easy to answer this once we land generics, right? There's a lot of stuff that we would write differently if we had generics. A lot of the built-in functions would be just a, a generic function. Yeah. So I think that's probably, maybe it's a cop-out, but that's my answer. No, but that's a good point. And like with generics, 
that's the interesting thing, isn't it? You almost wish you could just go back and rewrite the standard library in this. And to be honest, there's even code in the standard library that doesn't now look very go because it was written so early. So that's sort of always the curse you bear, really, with the backwards compatibility promise. But everyone's grateful, I think, for that promise. Any others? Anyone else got anything that they'd remove from Go if they were allowed to? Samir, what would you do? I'll I'll mention a few. Range variable loop capture. Mm -hmm. So this is just bites all of us when we write a closure inside a range loop. That may still be fixable. Depends. Mm. I think the, the confusion around nil pointers inside an interface and that not being nil itself, like the whole question of, reuse of nil in interfaces just creates a lot of confusion. I wonder if we could have done better there. And buff IO scanner. I don't like APIs where you know you run a loop and then you have to check whether the loop exited because of an error because you always forget to check. Mm. And I'm sensitive to this because back when I used to write C++ and I was on the maps team, I had a loop that had a similar API where I forgot to check for an error. And I dropped half a million places from the map index. Oh, wow because I forgot to check that error. So when I, when we introduced Buffer Scanner, I'm like, no, no, no. That will create really terrible bugs. But again, lost that argument. Did that just wipe out like loads of restaurants? <laughs> you know, no one noticed. So I think if you drop half a million random places from you know the location index, you're unlikely to hit stuff that's very important. Oh, wow. There you go. But I stayed up late and fixed it. Yeah, put them, just type them all back in from the phone book. It's very nice of you. <laughs> you got to, though, haven't you? Regenerate the index. Yes. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they're good ones. I would actually probably like to get rid of the new keyword and just have the curly brace way of making things because I always use that anyway. Now, if I see new, I'm like, what? Although I quickly do remember, (laughs) to my credit. Okay, so will there be a go-to? Johan Brandhorst actually asked this one from on Discord and so did Tahal Altinel. Will there be a go-to? I don't think we're going to make breaking changes to go. I think we'd rather find ways to support people, you know, fix things, like maybe some of the things we just described, range variables, for example, without breaking users. Like maintaining compatibility for users, like we would much rather do work on our end to minimize the work that, you know, the whole Go community has to do to adapt to these changes. So I think once you set aside breaking changes, go to becomes a marketing term. And I think it would probably break a lot more things than it would fix. I think the one remaining big language thing is the errors problem. And whether we ever come up with a fix for that and whether that fix requires language changes and how extensive they would be, I could conceivably see something go-to coming out of that. But I don't see anything else, even on the horizon, that would force us to go to a go-to. Yeah, it'd have to be a significant enough change, wouldn't it, to warrant something like that? But. I'm kind of glad that we don't have these multiple languages, you know, like Python code from one major version won't work on another. And the fact that our Go code has that long life, I think really does help us out a lot. And we can sort of rely on that, which is pretty important. Yeah. Anyone else? Anything else they'd remove? If not, Maybe the G. Sorry? Just keep it B-O. Just O. Remove the G. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Make it easier to do, uh, do the internal uh, Go links. Yeah, that would be easier. Typing out (laughs) most project names would be one character easier. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the command that kicks off a background, kicks off a go routine. There you go. Would just be O. O. It would just be an O routine (laughs) at that point, which is great. (laughs) Yeah, okay, good. I mean, yeah, 50%, you know, just cut that task time in half. Yeah, honestly, (laughs) the amount of um, internet that would save... I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's a lot. I like the idea that O is just the completion of the C. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. There you go. We missed opportunity, Alice. A good call. (laughs) I wasn't on the team back when. Yeah. No, it shows. Yeah. (laughs) Too late now. (laughs) Well, maybe the next version, breaking version, you can really break it by changing its entire name. (laughs) It'd be Olang. Yeah, I'm not against it. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's another interesting question that came in from Def Piano on Discord. And Def Piano asks, do any of y'all use GitHub Copilot for work, either Go or another language, or on personal projects? Have you played with GitHub Copilot? I don't think I know what GitHub Copilot is. Oh, Keith, it does your programming for you. <laughs> it does all your programming for you. <laughs> well, then what would I do day to day if it did all my programming for me? Chill out. Chill out. 
No, you still have to do some programming, unfortunately. But I could day drink instead of doing programming. It'd be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does it look up things on Stack Overflow for you? Yeah, it learns and it knows it's smart enough not to pick the top answer to, to scroll down a bit which is already smarter than me. Yeah, always go the second answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of, um, well, I'm not going to sell it. You've not heard of it. I think that speaks volumes. He does all his programming himself, does Keith. Yeah, this is actually, we've reached our time. This is all the time we've got. But thank you so much to everybody who's joined along and asked questions in the Discord. And thank you to Samir, Cameron, Alice, Rob, and Keith. And we'll see you next time on Go Time. We had a 45 minute hard stop at the event, but there were still questions left undiscussed. Thankfully, the Go team was gracious enough to stick around and continue chatting with us. So here's about 10 minutes of bonus answers for your listening pleasure. Enjoy. We did have a question from What J, who asked why Go uses this uh, uh, mark and sweep garbage collector instead of reference counting. That's quite an interesting technical one. Does anyone have an opinion? I'll give that to Keith. We can collect cycles, uh, which is h- harder to do with a reference counting collector. So sort of not impossible, but it means basically you write a mark and sweep collector also, which runs when the reference counter can't keep up. Uh. And so reference counting isn't a panacea, especially in a general language where you can have cycles amongst objects. In things like there are some other languages where you basically can't make cycles in various functional languages, in which case reference counting is quite a bit better. Mm. Yeah, that's the main reason. That's a great answer. There you go, what, Jay? Someone else asks about your favorite package in the standard library or if there are any packages outside in the community that you would like to see in the standard library. Have you got any favorites? I like the exec package. It's really convenient to start you know, sub-processes from Go. I think it was Brad Fitzpatrick design. It's just, I really like it. There's the way it works and it's easy to understand and easy to use. Mm. Yeah, it is a pretty good one. Uh, yeah, that's a nice answer. Any other answers, anyone? I'm curious what the community thinks should be a part of the standard library. Mm. Or what their favorite package is. <laughs> yes. Well, I know for a long time it was Testify, which was an assert package for making writing tests so you could just in one line do assertions. Um, I know this because I made that package. And... I know also lots of people don't like that package and it's quite interesting. Like Francesc Campoy famously was um, unhappy with it being uh, one of the most imported packages because there's kind of like, obviously the interface, like you're you're passing things through interfaces. So checking for equality in that way is, uh, it can be interesting, but I mean, the Go testing package kind of like has, hasn't really changed that much apart from obviously fuzzing's coming, which is going to be a big change. What do you feel about Testify? Matt, I was going to ask you, are you, are you going to generify Testify? Ooh, generify Testify. Sounds, it rhymes. So, uh, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> I like generify as being the new, the new word for what you do to your package after generics comes out. Yeah. It sounds like just making it old, though, doesn't it? Generify <laughs> also has that sound to it. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually right now writing a tool that I'm calling generify, which is basically just for testing generics. It goes through the standard library, it takes one package and adds a generic parameter to all the functions and types in that package. Mm. That never gets used, but it adds it all. And so we can then run all the tests again on that modified standard library and make sure everything still works. Huh. So it's sort of a test of the generics control flow. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and you know the, the changes it makes will never check in, but it's a good way to get a the, one of the big problems with testing generics is there is no generic code. Mm. So like, how do you test the generics work when there's no generic code to test it on? Mm. So we sort of need a way to sort of automatically manufacture generic code so we can run lots of code through the generic portion of the compiler. That's getting way too meta. It's like watching Inception. It is a little bit meta. A little bit, yeah. We're going to do that in, while going into someone's dreams. <laughs> That's the sort of deal there. Mm. Yeah. That is interesting, though, as an approach. It's funny, like, I wonder if it's possible to have generic code where if you, like, you you sort of hinted at this earlier, but if you ignored the generic piece altogether, could it just fall back by default to an any type and still work, but it's generic but any? Like, would something like that be backwards compatible? I don't know. Just occurred to me, but, yeah. 
that works for arguments, but it doesn't work for return values. So there's sort of this covariance contravariance thing, which doesn't quite work. But if with the right typecast, you could maybe make it work. So maybe you could have a tool that goes through and just puts the typecasts in where they're needed and mm. maybe it would work. Huh. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting once people start writing generic code. And, you know, like we had Go for, it's been around 12 years now, and some practices that things that we consider to be good practice in Go really only came out much later in its life. So I think we do expect the same thing probably to happen with generics. There's going to be, we'll learn, we'll make those mistakes, and then we'll be like, okay, don't use generics like this. And that'll be a talk. Someone will give it a meetup. And then at that meetup, they'll meet the person of their dreams. And you've basically made that happen. You made their dreams come true by adding generics, essentially. That could, that's just one scenario that could happen. I'm not saying it is definitely going to happen. I like this because, you know, we did exactly this with channels and Go routines in the early days of Go. We were using Go routines and channels for everything. Iterators, do you remember that? It was ridiculous. So we're going to have to make exactly the same mistakes this time around. Like I said in the in the broader in the live stream, we're going to need sort of the 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 old what's the word I'm looking at? crotchety go community <laughs> to uh, sort of constrain the enthusiasm and be like, no, don't be stupid, do it well, <laughs> right? Use it, yeah. use it well. I do want to find someone who goes completely overboard on using generics, and then we can have them be a test case of like this is what you should not do. Yeah. And so if any of you out there are listening and want to be that person, like go yeah. for it and then email us your your package. There was a GopherCon talk on like how to abuse struct tags, struct field tags. And it was delightful because oh, yeah. like all sorts of terrible things. And I mean, we need some of that for generics, like how to truly abuse generics, do terrible, terrible things. There you go. So if you want to be Go's generic devil's advocate, <laughs> get in touch and they'd, they'd like to roast you. You could be like a roast. <laughs> Yeah, that's how we could do it. Abuse. <laughs> yeah. That's true, though, for, with channels. I used to be the same. Everything was a channel. Like, if I'm going to open a file, I'm sending those bytes down a channel. I've got channels now. I'm channeling everything. And, yeah, and I, honestly, like, weight group, I, that tends to be what I reach for now. If I'm doing, if I'm writing concurrent code, I'll, I'll often have a small little place and have a weight group and call out to things. And But channels sometimes, again, perfect for the right situation. So Matt, you've actually touched on probably one of the most promising but unexplored areas of generics, which is uh, concurrency libraries. So we have weight group and error group, which do a really nice job of packaging up certain idioms around concurrency. Generics might allow us to package them up even more nicely because mm. you can have things that, you know, I want to do a scatter gather collection of things and breaths parameterized by whatever type T. Like I have a bunch of producer functions that return T's and I want to run them all and collect them and just get back a slice of T's. Like you can use generics to write that library. You could just wrap, you know, weight group or error group. So mm -hmm. I think there are things like that, where as we discover common idioms where you want to apply a little concurrency, you can wrap that up and you don't even see the concurrency anymore. Now that has costs and trade-offs because that's a hidden cost, but who knows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can help eliminate a lot of dumb errors, essentially. Like places where you end up with data races because you just got something small wrong. If you find those idioms, we can correct for that. Yeah, great stuff. So ESM on Discord asks, what are some other language features that came from other languages that you might like to steal from? Or maybe you can't, but you wish you could. Yeah, I, I think in my experience writing generic code, one of the, the things I'm noticing is that I use function closures a lot more. And I think a more concise function closure syntax would gel really nicely with generics. I see. But this is a bit like how in JavaScript you can have a function typed out, function with brackets, or you can just have the empty brackets with the fat arrow. And they both work. Would you break the way function closures worked? Like the syntax? Are you talking about that? I, it's pure, pure syntax. I would just, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but it's something that I'm immediately noticing. Mm -hmm. So don't quote me on this and say that I've endorsed this in the future, but I think it's something that would be interesting to explore. Maybe Alice can help. You could change it from funk just to fun. Mm. It sounds, <laughs> sound, you know, you can. We could test that. Yeah, just drop the C. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So these ones are fun because, you know, they're shorter. Loads shorter. 25% saving. And they're so much more fun. Aren't they? <laughs> That's what everyone's saying. <laughs> okay, any other features you've seen in other languages? I'm really inspired by what Rust has done around static data race avoidance and, and you know, ownership and lifetime tracking. 
you know, Rust comes at the cost of a very steep learning curve and slow compiles. So the question is, can we learn and be inspired by Rust to improve Go's safety, static safety, particularly with respect to data races, by learning from what Rust has done, but maintain the really fast compiles and the easy, ease of learning Go? Yeah, that's quite interesting. And I also wonder if like additional tooling could could help on on things like whether, you know, with, with that, I don't know. Yeah. That is something our static analysis team has looked at is can you provide better, say, safety around mutexes mm. and static data race detection? And the open question is, can you do that with Go code as it exists today? Or do we need to add more? Does the programmer have to say more in order to do this? Yeah, right. Hmm. I quite like the question mark notation in TypeScript where if an object is nil, you know, essentially you can do question mark. That would be a panic if you're doing a dot, so calling something on nil, you get then a panic and go. The question mark dot notation makes that okay and it'll just return an empty value or something. I don't know if that's right for Go. I quite like how explicit everything is in Go. But when you're dealing with like data that you don't understand fully the structure of it, those sorts of things can be pretty useful. If, especially in the templates, like we, we could probably have that in the templates. I would have thought. Can you maybe someone do that on tomorrow? It's certainly useful in in the Fumped package that if you give it you give it a percent s and you give it an integer, like it knows how to handle that and never crashes. And if it's confused about what's there, it prints something in the output instead of crashing. Yeah. So that sort of resilience against failure like does exist in portions of Go, but yeah, it's not sort of in the core language. Yeah, I just do V percent V on everything. <laughs> I mean, Go Go has you know d doesn't panic on nil receivers, so that's nice. But we, and we've seen with like the protobuf mm -hmm. package how how nice it is to be able to call methods on nil receivers and to make that a more generic, more general feature could be nice. Yeah, yeah, I've seen loggers that had like worked with nil; they would just be silent, and so the way to make a logger silent was nil, but. I also got a pull request, I think, someone making that explicit, which, you know, also kind of makes sense. But yeah, very interesting stuff. Well, thank you so much for staying after the party. This has been the Go Time, Go for Con mashup after party. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm doing my uh, hosting duties. I'm not supposed to laugh at it, Samir. This is me being professional. <laughs> professional party. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. It's a t-shirt with a jacket. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you get. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, really. This has been our final official episode of Go Time in 2021. We always take a couple weeks off at the end of the year to do some garbage collection of our own. But we have lots of awesomeness headed your way on the other side, including two more episodes from GopherCon. Thank you for listening to us this year. We know how precious your time is, and we love that you choose to spend some of it with us. Go Time is produced by Jared Santo, that's me, with music by Breakmaster Cylinder, that's somebody else. We are brought to you by some awesome partners. Special thanks to Fastly, LaunchDarkly, and Linode. That's our show for today. We'll talk to you next year on Go Time.